rules, rules, rules. <clears throat> they seem to be everywhere in our lives. They're, they're always around us. And they seem to tell us what we can and cannot do. It's kind of like in the classic children's story, The Cat in the Hat, by Dr. Seuss. You see, it was a rainy day. The kids couldn't go outside and play. All they could do was sit on the couch. They were bored. All they could do was sit, sit, sit. And they didn't like it, not one bit. They knew the rules. They shouldn't have let the cat in. But it seemed so much more fun than just sitting around all day. Plus, Mom wasn't home anyway. What could go wrong? At least that's what they thought. You see, sometimes for you and I, we, we're like those kids in the story of the cat in the hat. We feel like the rules are all about keeping us away from what we want to do, limiting what we want to do. Because there are rules of the road that limit us from getting where we want to go as fast as we'd like. Right? There are speed limits. There are rules that say we have to be to work or to school on time, which means we can't sleep in. What a drag. And then there's the rules in our homes, and I'm still not entirely convinced that my mom had this for the right reasons, but for some reason she wouldn't let me eat my dessert before dinner. I mean, how cruel can you get to a kid? And, and so when we hear the Ten Commandments, it can sound like just another set of rules, just another list of what we can and cannot do. I mean, at least that's how it sounds when we start with Exodus 20, verse 3. We start by saying, you shall have no other gods before me. It sounds like God's just giving us another set of rules. Certainly, they're, they're weightier rules. They're, they're God's rules, so they're, they're probably right. They're probably a little bit better. But it sounds like just another set of limitations for you and me. At least that's what happens when we begin there. But... As Pastor Girdle noted a couple weeks ago, where you start matters. I mean, he was, he was talking about the whole story of Scripture, starting at Genesis 1 and going to the end to get a true picture of God. But that's also true about the smaller narratives, about the smaller stories. Because when you start at Genesis, even two verses earlier, you get a different picture. And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. All of a sudden, the picture is that God has already acted. God has already done something for us. God cares for his people first. You see, this is chapter 5 of the story. And only now do we get God giving us explicit rules. And, and if you actually read the scripture, this is 70 chapters into the biblical story. So for 70 chapters, God was building a relationship with people. Showing that he was concerned about them before they did the right thing. Before they acted. You see, in the story of Abraham, God said he would give him the, the child of promise. And even though Abraham took matters into his own hands and tried to have that child of promise with Hagar, God continued to bless him and gave him the child of promise, Isaac. And then we have Jacob. A no good, lying, cheating, scoundrel and manipulator who, who does everything he can the wrong way to get an advantage. And yet that's still the person God chooses to bless and make into the nation of Israel through his children. And then we have the leader of the Israelites now that they're being delivered from Egypt, Moses, the, the great leader who, who got the Ten Commandments. But do you guys remember why he left Egypt in the first place? He looked to his left, he looked to his right, he didn't see anyone, and he killed the Egyptian slave master. He didn't do the right thing, and yet God still called him. God still acted in their favor, favor before they did the right thing. Before they were the right kind of people. God continues to act on their behalf. And you see, even if we just go one chapter earlier to Exodus 19, God sort of gives us this image of, of why he's doing what he's doing says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God calls these people, not because of who they are, but because of his love. 
God acts, before they've done anything right, before they've been a good kind of people, before they follow the rules, and in fact, immediately after the story, after getting the Ten Commandments and saying, we will do all that the Lord has commanded, they make the golden idol. They worship that. But God continues to be faithful, continues to call his people, because he is faithful, he is just, he is merciful. You see, God called out his people out of the, the pagan nations to be a distinct people, to be a holy people. And to be holy means to be set apart. So they were to be different from the nations around them. Because the nations, the pagan nations then, they were the kind of people that sacrificed their children, that lived adulterous lives, that worshipped anything under the sun. In fact, they even worshipped the sun. And so God was calling a these people, the nation of Israel, to be a light in the darkness, to be a distinct people that would draw the pagan nations to worship the one true God. God was calling them and, and giving these commandments to help them live lives that were faithful, that were just, that were loving, caring, and, and, all, and compassionate. Because God is loving, caring, compassionate, and merciful. And so when you and I hear the commandments... It's not about seeing how well we can follow them, about trying to prove ourselves in front of God. Rather, it's God caring and knowing what's best for us. Because God is a loving Father. So you see, in the cat in the hat, they were given these rules for the home to avoid disasters, to avoid everything falling apart. You know, the speed limits, as much as sometimes I don't want to follow them, are there not to prevent us from getting there quickly, but to make sure everyone gets there safely. And my mom, the tyrant that she is that wouldn't let me eat my dessert before dinner, knew that having the vegetables, having the fruit, having the other, the other healthy things is what would make me grow up to be this dashing young man that I am. You know, and, and so the Ten Commandments are there to help us live better lives, to help us be healthy by not lying to one another, by not cheating other people or, or hating other people or sleeping with other people's wives or, or lying, and by worshiping the one true God instead of chasing after empty, meaningless, lifeless idols. Back then it might have been a golden calf, but today that can look like money or success or any other number of things. But God was calling them and is calling us to be a distinct people. You see, God didn't give us the Ten Commandments so we could, wor so we could work up the ladder and climb to God so we could do the right thing, say the right thing, and get him to act on our behalf, as if God is a vending machine that if you just push the right buttons, say the right prayer, he'll do what you want. That's not how God works. You see, God acts before we do the right thing, and often after we do the wrong thing, to be honest. You see, even in Matthew, Jesus reminds us that God causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. He causes the sun to shine on the, the just and the unjust alike. God acts. God acted on behalf of the people of Israel when he came to Egypt and took them out of the hand of, out of Pharaoh's hand, out of the land of slavery. God acted when the world was against him. He sent his very own son, Jesus Christ in the incarnation. He came to his people to be present, came to the world to redeem them. And he comes to you and me. He comes even though we're God's enemies. As Romans 5, 8 reminds us that that God sent his son while we were still sinners. And, and while we were not fans of the God who judges all creation, who is perfect, God came and he said, I want you. I want you. I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. I want you to know my love, my mercy, my compassion. I want you to know who I am. And so he comes to us in the waters of baptism, in, in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper, in the words of absolution and in his own word. He comes to us to remind us that he is there with us and he is for us. He is for you no matter where you are, no matter where you've been, no matter how much you're struggling right now. You see, the Ten Commandments, sometimes they, they sound like a list of rules, but they're actually more like the North Star. They're kind of this, this idea that guides us back to where we're supposed to be. It reminds us what having a, a loving relationship with God the Father looks like, what treating our neighbors in love looks like. 
It reminds us when we've wandered off the path. It gives us our bearings to how we're, we're called to live as God's holy, called out people. And so the, the Ten Commandments aren't just a list of do's and don'ts to try and prove yourself. It's God giving us a way to live healthier lives because he cares for us. You see, the, in the Old Testament, God called his people, the nation of Israel, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And in 1 Peter, God calls us, the church, that same thing. But you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You know, God called us out. We, once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not had mercy, but now God has had mercy on us. And as that called out, loved people of God, we are able to go out and live good lives that, that point to the one true God for pagans so that hopefully when they see our behavior, even though they might accuse us of being judgmental, of being intolerant, that when God returns, they might praise us for our actions, for the way we've lived our lives. Because when we've experienced God's mercy and God's grace, our lives, our hearts begin to be transformed. We, day by day, become to begin to look more and more Christ-like. And we can reflect his glory out into the world. Today's Old Testament lesson, when, when God gives Moses the, the Ten Commandments, he's giving it because he's calling Israel and he's calling us today to be a counter-cultural people. A people that are in the world, but not of the world. So that we can live by, by doing things a little bit differently than what culture might say is acceptable. Living a little bit of a different kind of lifestyle that might point back to the one true God. And, and it's not about following the rules better than anyone else to prove yourself. Because the fact is, none of us can follow the Ten Commandments perfectly. And, and the law always says do, 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 do. And you never can. But Christ came and he said it's done. And then he gave us the new command in John 15. This is what you're supposed to look like as my people. Love one another as I have loved you. Do you hear him calling? He's saying, follow me. Love as I have loved. Serve as I have served. That means that, that you, the, the church, the body of Christ, need to go out to the world, or, or to go out to the world as missionaries. And I know we tend to think of missionaries as people that go overseas, or maybe possibly the pastors. But I don't know if you know the statistics. Almost 50% of Wichita is non-Christian. They don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That means 250,000 people in the greater Wichita area don't know the loving, merciful, compassionate God that you know. And as, as great as Pastor Bingenheimer and Pastor Girdle and DCE Cindy are, there is no way that three people can reach 250,000. It's not one person. It takes a movement. And that means that, that you and me, God's people, are a missionary people. We're a missionary people by, by loving the way God has called us to love in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools. When we go out for dinner or shop, we start to live the way that God calls us to live. And, and hopefully, those outside the church will see your good works, will see your love, will see the way that you live out as God's called people and will be drawn to the truth, to the one true God, that they might see their need for him. So as you leave this place, when you leave here tonight, recognize that, that you are loved by God. You don't have to do anything to earn that love. God loves you no matter where you are. But God also sends you. He sends you out into this community, into your homes, your workplaces, to be God's people, to be the light in the darkness, to be the salt of the earth, the city on a hill. And so as you go, may, may the truth, the grace, the love of the one true God keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Please rise as we continue with the